Welcome to the Therapeutic Food Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Mary Mitchell. I'm an integrative nutrition health coach, therapeutic diet expert, and founder of The Road to Living Whole. There are many different diets out there. It's hard to know which one is right for you with your chronic illness and autoimmune disease. In this podcast, I'm going to share with you the foundational pieces every single therapeutic diet out there shares, and also how to use the best one for your particular diagnosis. If you've been looking for a meal planning partner, help navigating the complicated healthcare system, and want to feel better quickly, I'm your girl. Grab your kombucha and notebook. Let's dive in. Welcome back, everyone. I am absolutely and totally excited for today's episode. We have somebody, an expert here. Her name is Amy, and she is an expert in the food manufacturing, the food processing process, and also a very avid health advocate. And she is going to help us bust some myths around modern farming practices and food processing practices, and hopefully remove some of the fear that we have and help us kind of navigate all the information that we're seeing online on how, where food comes from and how it's raised and how it's processed. Cause I know that there's a lot of information out there and there's a lot of extremes and I've learned, you know, I learned that it was absolutely like horrible animal practices. And then later on when I was actually working with, I was a sign language interpreter, I was working with an equine science program and I actually learned how cows are raised and how they're processed. And I was like mind blown. And and it just kind of made me start questioning everything. So I'm really, really thrilled to have Amy here. And we are going to just kind of discuss the process and how it works and what it looks like, and hopefully give us all some comfort around the food that we're buying at the grocery store and, you know, farmer's markets and all of that good stuff. So Amy, hi, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Marion. I'm so excited to be here with you today. Your intro um, was amazing and overwhelming because there's a lot that we can unpack today. But do you want me to start by giving a little bit about my background? Yes. I think people want to know why you're an expert and how you became one. Yeah. Well, I'm a farmer's daughter from North Dakota. I run a business called Farmer's Daughter Consulting. And I do work with the food industry. Most of my clients are representing farmers, ranchers, and other folks who grow and produce food for the rest of us. I grew up on a farm in Northeast North Dakota, and I became a registered dietitian and realized I didn't really want to stand over someone's hospital bed and talk to them about what maybe they could have done differently 20, 30 years ago. I wanted to work in a different part of health promotion and health education and research. So I got a master's in nutrition communications and marketing, and I discovered during grad school that I really loved working with the food industry. I started with General Mills during graduate school. I later worked for Dole Food Company, talking a lot about canned pineapple and other fruit and vegetable products. I then went out and worked for the California Walnut Board and Commission, representing the walnut farmers here in California. And then I worked for the Culinary Institute of America for many, many years, leading continuing education conferences for chefs and other food service professionals, where we would bring in representatives from the food industry that supplies products to restaurants across this country and help kind of build some bridges of understanding of how those products were produced, why certain choices are made. Today, I do this consulting work. I absolutely love it. And, you know, as a registered dietitian, I always want to be science-based, but I'm very much in tune with the emotions that connect us when we're talking about the best choices for ourselves, for our families, how our values align with the choices we make, So I'm happy to, you know, address your starting questions on what's been on your mind lately. Yeah. You know, when you're, I think she's a publicist or, you know, the person who markets for you for podcasts reached out, uh, what really stood out to me was the food industry because there, I feel like everything I read is so extreme in one direction or another. And knowing what I know about like diets and food and things like that, I know that there's a middle, there's a middle ground in there. The extremes are both fear-based and I'm, I want information, right? And so when it comes to like 
food. Like I, obviously North Dakota is like a lot of cattle, a lot of Buffalo, you know, things like that. So I guess where I would like to start is, and I think a lot of people have a fear, especially now with climate change, you know, being a big concern and stuff is how you know, our cattle like ripped from their moms, never seen again, raised in these small pins in dirt and poop and all that. Or do they, are they raised on these small family farms and then, and then sold at auction and then maybe plumped up before they go to slaughter? You know, I feel like maybe we could kind of dive into some of that and then also talk about the slaughtering process and the, and the, the processing of that. And is it as dirty as is portrayed is, or do they really care about the animals or don't they? Like, I feel like there's just like all this information that's so like emotion turning and it's like. I, I know what I know, um, but I'd love to know what you know and see if they align. Well, you're asking about a topic that is both personally and professionally really important to me. So I'm the youngest of five kids. And when I was born many, many years ago, uh, my dad had about 1,200 acres of land, about half of which he couldn't grow crops on. The land is near the Red River Valley in North Dakota, and that valley was created by a glacier, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, that glacier pushed a lot of rock up onto what's called the beach, which is a joke in North Dakota. There are no beaches. There's no water there except for a few small lakes. So growing up on the beach, my dad had a lot of land that was really rocky. He could never, ever pick out all the rocks to till it and plant crops there. But the land produces this amazing native grasses, 30 to 40 different types of grasses growing out in these pastures. It's perfect for letting livestock graze. They can eat things that you and I can't. The bacteria in their gut turn that into beneficial you know, energy and nutrients for the cattle. And so growing up, I had cattle around all the time. Once in a while, like a, a mother cow would have twins and one of them would have to be a bottle calf. So my dad would hold me as I'd hold the bottle as the calf would be tugging on the bottle and we'd be feeding it. My dad never wanted to leave the farm because he never wanted to leave his cattle. You know, it was it was a very sweet relationship. And so I grew up with a great respect for these animals. And we would twice a year, there'd be a spring steer that would be slaughtered to fill our deep freeze with beef. And then again, in the fall, the naughtiest steer of the summer, the one who got out the most often when they'd move them from pasture to pasture, that would be the naughty steer would be taken each fall. You know, so beef was part of what I ate growing up often twice a day. As I moved, you know, into into college and grad school and started working in this industry, I realized that a lot of people don't appreciate how critically important cattle ranching is to farm families all across this country. About two thirds of the land in the U.S. that's used for agriculture can't grow crops. It's either really rocky like the land I grew up on. The soil quality is poor. There's not enough topsoil. Maybe it's land that's sloped so that it's not safe for putting machinery on. Lots of reasons why that land can't be used. And so that land can be productive by letting livestock graze on it. So when I say livestock, I'm talking primarily cattle. You did mention bison. Um, they're part of herd animals that are livestock as well. And North Dakota, where I grew up, has quite a few herds that are you know, domesticated now. Well, as much as you can domesticate a bison. Apparently, they're very happy when they're well fed. And if they're not, they can take down any fence. Um, <laughs> you know, but we're not, what I'm not talking about are pigs, chickens. They're fed differently, they're raised differently. Um, but, you, you know, your point about what's the life of cattle like the calves um, on a ranch are kept with their moms um, for up to a year, then they are separated out. And at some, typically around two years of age, somebody like my dad running what's called a cow-calf operation will sell off those two-year-old cattle and they'll go to a feedlot operation where they will then spend four to eight months being fed. Um, it's very interesting how they're fed in feedlots. There are big operations that essentially make them puffed corn corn is infused, you know, high heat moisture, it's puffed. And that makes the nutrients in the corn more available for the cattle. They are herd animals, which means they like to be with their friends. So you can see a pasture that's maybe, you know, 20 acres in size, 
but all the cattle are in one part of the pasture. It happens in feedlots too. They have plenty of room in, in these massive feedlots to move around, but they like to be near each other. Like, they like to be next to each other, scratching on each other, you know, and and so that that's one of the pieces of misinformation that I like to myth bust. Um, so, so what you're saying is, is they're not kept in these tight quarters being, ru- you know, being rubbed raw on purpose to like torture them for max amount of money. You're saying that they have room and the cows just go, eh, I like my friends. I like my friends. They rub against stuff because they get itchy, just like we do. They'll rub against a fence post. They'll rub against their neighbor. And, you know, what the goal of feedlot operations is, is to get those animals to a size, it's called a marketable weight, where you're getting the maximum amount of food out of that animal. When it comes to climate change in the cattle industry, the number one factor that has an influence on how much each animal's impact is on the environment is the the, the length of its life. So a cow that is 100% fed on grass takes much longer to reach that marketable weight. A cow that is finished in a feedlot gets there much sooner. So that animal's lifespan has been shortened. That animal is using up less feed, less water, um, putting out less methane. Yes, cattle produce methane. Um, they belch it out. Part of that, the bacteria in their gut is what creates methane as a byproduct of those beneficial bacteria, helping them break down things like grass and hay and corn stalks. Anyway, and so methane comes from many other sources. And I think a lot of people think that it's all the cattle. Well, methane comes from our human waste. It comes from food waste. You know, when we're wasting 40% of the food that's produced by farms and ranches around the world, that is a shameful waste of resources. And when food waste from like a big Thanksgiving meal where people didn't want leftovers, so it was dumped in the trash, that goes to a landfill. Maybe if you're in a municipality that does composting, then that has, you know, a, a better purpose than just sitting in a landfill. But if it's sitting in a landfill being wasted, that's creating methane which is contributing to these greenhouse gas emissions that are impacting climate change. So, okay, the cows now have been in that feedlot. They're at a marketable weight. What's the experience like? I think a lot of your listeners maybe have heard of Temple Grandin. She's an exceptional researcher in the livestock industry who has studied how do you make that process of going to harvest the most humane and the least stressful for each animal. And it's part of these circular pathways that they walk through when they are stunned or killed. It happens very quickly. And I've been in two of these major facilities, one here in California, one in Colorado, watching the process. I can't say that it's pleasant, but it is very respectful And the workers in these facilities, as they are breaking down the carcasses, are so like respectful and reverential. They have incredible equipment that is ergonomically designed so that it is a safe process for them. They are working very hard. I mean, they are very efficient in what they're doing. But it was, I'm really glad that I've had those opportunities because it is, it is alleviated a lot of my tension about the process for the animals as well as for the workers. Yeah, I think what a lot of people don't understand is the the people doing the processing don't want a stressed animal because a stressed animal changes the texture and the flavor of the meat. And the the slaughtering process is painless. They have no idea it's coming. They're being hugged basically as they come in and they don't see it coming and there's no pain. Like it is the absolute most humane way it can go. And I remember learning about that and feeling so betrayed because I had been told how awful it is and how horrible their lives are. And it's, I was just like, how do I get that information out? So I'm really glad you're talking about that because it is something that I think a lot of people don't understand and aren't willing to be educated on because it, it is a hard process, I think, to witness. And so it's easier to think, to just kind of block it out and just think that it comes from the grocery store, right? Or, you know, to avoid it altogether because you want to save the animals <laughs> or whatever um, it is. I've been a, I've been a vegetarian. I've been a vegan. I, I, I know that the thought process and all of that. 
but you know, once you learn the symbiotic relationship that animals have with the earth and with us, the slaughtering process, it's not this horrible thing. And it's absolutely a loving thing to do, really. Yeah, I mean, the respect for the animals, these animals that are part of our food system, they aren't pets. I mean, and I think that's one of the tendencies for us when we have cats, dogs, other pets at home, you know, we give them our traits and we impress our emotions on them. But when you're running an operation like this, the farmers and ranchers, their families, they care about these animals immensely, but they realize that their purpose is to become part of the food system. And so to your point about wanting to reduce stress, to have a humane harvest process, it's for the animal, it's for the quality of the meat. Stress hormones create tougher connective tissues, tougher musculature in the animals almost instantaneously. And it's just like us, when we get stressed, we get all tensed up. So there's so much science and so much respect that goes into all of this. And it's, you know, it's critically important for us as people who have the privilege of going to a grocery store and shopping, we've got the easy part of this, but there is a lot of risk and and stress and tension for the farmers and ranchers being in a society where there is misinformation about what they're doing. So I am so happy to have this opportunity to share more of this information with your audience, Marian. Yeah, me too. I love removing fear. And I love empowering people to make educated decisions. So I'm really glad as well. So now I would like to maybe move on to processed fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I feel like, you know, there's there's been a recent like breakout in, I, I can't remember what, if it was listeria or something else, but in like fruit, right? And then you see it in spinach and lettuce regularly. And, and I think there's just a lot that we don't know about that process. So maybe you can enlighten us a little bit there as well. Yeah. Well, when I worked for Dole Food Company many, many years ago, my whole job was focused on teaching kids and their parents. Um, We worked through elementary schools all across the United States and teaching kids, teachers, their parents, their caregivers about the importance of eating more fruits and vegetables. And at that time, Dole was one massive company with a fruit division, a vegetable division, the canned fruit division, It was about helping people embrace all forms of fruits and vegetables because this was back in the early 2000s. People weren't eating enough. Guess what? We're still not. One out of 10 people in the U.S. meets their their minimum recommended intake each day for fruits and vegetables. When fruits and vegetables are minimally processed, and by that I mean turned into 100% juice, frozen, canned, dried, minimal processing, It makes them more convenient. It makes them safer in many aspects. When when you're a a stressed out mom and you've got kids clamoring, mom, mom, what's for dinner? You've got a spouse like I do that's like, what are we going to eat tonight? And I'm like, "Uh, give me a moment. And I think, oh, thank goodness I have that frozen broccoli that's in the package that I can just steam in the package in the microwave while I'm quickly cooking, you know, some chicken breasts and some rice or something, right? The value of these value added minimally processed products. I mean, I could just go on and on and on about this, like the salads in a bag, huge innovation. Now we've had it for 20 some years. Gosh, if you're not somebody who has great knife skills, you don't want to cut up the lettuce, even though I think that's really easy and really enjoyable. I'm kind of a super nerdy dork when it comes to produce prep. I love going into my kitchen at the end of the day, putting on some smooth jazz, pulling out my cutting board and knife. And I just, I find it very soothing, but that's me. I don't have kids, so I don't have that pressure. Yeah, I love it when I don't have my kids. (laughs) And when I do, I'm like, you know, give me the convenience. I haven't chopped my own broccoli in years. Or my own cauliflower for that. I mean, sometimes I do. Like when I'm creating recipes or I'm making a very specific one, I'll chop my own cauliflower just because I can get more than a bag. But like for my kid, like during the week, I'm like, I'm roasting cauliflower. I'm roasting broccoli. I'm roasting carrots. And the shortcuts, the shortcuts help because we get home and we're hungry. So it's the difference between dinner being ready in 45 minutes to an hour and being ready in 15 to 20 minutes. Right. And, you know, as a coach, people are always amazed when I'm like, hey, Let's talk shortcuts. What's going to make it easy for you to eat this food? Amen. Right. And, you know, how can we make it taste the best so that you actually like it when you eat it? 
I think that the, those are my two most important things. And it's like having options in there that make life easy. Understanding that frozen actually can be better than fresh because they're flash frozen, right? Yep. So all the nutrients are still there. And as long as you don't overcook them, they stay in there, you know, and things. Like, so it's like, uh, and understanding that pre-cut broccoli, it's okay that you don't chop your own broccoli, right? Like you don't have to do that. And just giving people permission to outsource some of that process is a game changer when it comes to actually being able to eat it. Absolutely. I mean, we need every single innovation, technology, value-added processing possible to make it easier for people to eat more fruits and vegetables. We all know they're good for us. We're all striving for better health and wellness. We want to be proud of our food choices and what we're doing for our families and loved ones. So when you're a mom buying apple slices in the bag and somebody's shaming you for that, shame on them because you're doing something great, giving your kid that delicious snack that he or she loves. When you're buying, you know, the frozen corn that already has the sauce in it, great. You're putting a vegetable in front of your family that has a flavor that's making it more appealing for your four-year-old as well as your 40-year-old husband, right? I mean, all of this stuff needs to be celebrated and respected. I get lots of questions about canned beans. Like, well, isn't it better to cook from dry? If you like doing that, but that's like, you got to have forethought, like 24 hours in advance. As I say, 24 to 48 yeah. hours in advance, you have to prep. And then a lot, you know, what some people do, and I feel like this comes with enjoyment, time and ability, cooking ability, right? Because I tried, I've tried on several occasions to make beans that dried beans into fresh beans and it fails every single time. And I'm like, you know what? I don't care anymore. If I'm going to eat them, I'm going to get them from the can because at least they turn out and I'm yep. not a bad cook. I actually consider I have a cookbook. I love cooking. I'm a recipe creator, but I cannot cook dried beans. I, I cannot well, do it. I don't know how I don't, I, I follow the directions to a T I had uh, for a while, uh, Mexican in-laws and they do all their beans from dried and they would do it and it would turn out great. I would do it at home and they were still rock hard. Like, I don't, I don't know. There's, there's a few tricks I can share. Okay. So, okay. One of them is there's, there's this old, old notion that you can't add anything but water to your beans when you're soaking them. Research by um, a, a PhD food scientist who lives in Northern California. He did this about 10 years ago. And the research showed that when you add salt to the soaking water, it enhances the intake of water into those dry beans so that more of them become that soft, perfect, pleasing texture. But there's a problem with getting the right bean. And I'm using air quotes for all your listeners out there, the right bean. You don't know how long a dry bean has sat on a supermarket shelf. So your in-laws likely were buying beans at a place that turned over a lot of beans because they had loyal shoppers who loved eat beans and their dry beans weren't sitting on the shelf that long. But I know that I can go into my local store and I can look at some of the packages of their store brand beans sold in one pound packages and I can see a little dust on them. I'm like, oh, nobody's buying these because nobody wants to go through the process. So those beans could have been on that shelf a year, two years, and the older beans get, the harder it is to cook them to that creamy, soft perfection. I wonder if that was my problem. <laughs> but anyways, because of that, I was like, dried beans are going to be my go-to, you know, BPA free cans. Yep. And know. all the, all the manufacturers who put stuff in cans now it's BPA free. Yeah. And I think that's another thing that people think that like, even if it's not advertised on the can, they actually are BPA free. Yeah. There was a time when that wasn't true, but in these days it is. And yes, you know, there might be something else and people, you know, there's, there's people who are like, Oh, just don't do it. Blah, blah, blah. And I feel like there's almost stages of healthy and you know, me being in the thick of it, I had, I just have to find the balance. Like I do a lot, I do a lot of fresh. I do a lot of very clean, but I have my backups and I'm going to use them because they make my life easier. When I make my own hummus, I do bank them from a can. Yeah, sure. They taste better when the chickpeas are homemade. But because of the problems that I've had, I'm just like, you know what? I'm buying canned. Yeah. I found the brand that doesn't have a metallic taste with through lots of experimentation and willingness to throw things away, which I think is another thing. Like, yes, food waste sucks. But as you're learning how to do it, if it doesn't taste good, you don't have to eat it. Don't be yeah. miserable eating healthy food. 
So that was kind of like one of my, that's like one of the things that I try to stress with people is like, you have to do what's going to be easiest for you. And there has to be some balance in there somewhere. You know, I think I published a cookbook earlier this year called Cooking All the Heart. And it's about promoting cardiovascular wellness, but also promoting joy in the home kitchen and giving yourself permission to do exactly what we're talking about. Use some convenience products, have a pantry that's stocked with items that make it easy to put something together when you're a little time stressed, but you need to soothe yourself with the act of cooking. You know, it's, it's really important to get out of our way when it comes to promoting health and wellness. You know, I've lived with type one diabetes for 45 years. So every single day I'm thinking about what are my behaviors, actions, and attitudes that are going to lead me to maybe get to a 50th wedding anniversary one day. (laughs) I will be in my mid eighties if that happens. So I got to be a nice wife. It's going to happen. You got this. (laughs) I got to be a nice wife. So my husband wants to stay married to me, but I also have to maintain my health. And so, you know, when I take steps back and I look at the body of research, it's not that one product, that one meal It's the overall pattern of what you're doing. And, you know, in nutrition, it is the eating pattern. It is not single foods. It is not single nutrients. It is that eating pattern. And the biggest change that the vast majority of people need to do, get more of those fruits and vegetables. It's often not what's in your diet that's problematic. It's what's not in your eating pattern that's problematic. Oh, I love how you're smiling right now. You've got the best dimples and you've got this beautiful (laughs) smile as you're nodding. Yes, because it's absolutely true. And I I haven't put it that way and I haven't heard put that way. And I'm like in love with it. I'm like, I'm filing it away because it really is the eating pattern. Like, you know, in the health health and wellness field or, you know, in, in this group that we're in, people get so focused on isolated nutrients and And it's like, yeah, I mean, like these things are important, but it's like everything works in a symbiotic relationship. If you you have too much of one, you're going to deplete another. And really it's about your patterns. And yes, most, I mean, most adults actually need more protein too. Most, uh, um, most people are, are really heavy on the carbs, really light on the protein and the produce. Right. But it is all about the pattern. And I love that you put it that way. And hopefully by demystifying the food manufacturing process, we are able to hopefully remove some of the fear that I think a lot of people have around produce because they're like, and I'm not the biggest fan of inorganic pesticides and herbicides and fungicides, but people are so scared that they won't even buy the produce to begin with. Well, let's talk about that right now. You're not alone in being fearful of that. I mean, the word pesticide instills a lot of fear in a lot of people for many legitimate reasons, but why do growers use them? Well, when you're a farmer and you're looking at putting in um, inputs for a crop, you've got the labor, you've got the equipment, you've got the fuel to, to run those tractors and whatnot, you've got the seeds, you want to protect that. And there are a lot of threats in the environment from things, you know, you kind of listed herbicides kill weeds that compete with the the beneficial plants. Insects eat eat them and also transfer. um, They can transfer bacteria. There's bacteria, there's viruses, there's fungi. There can be rodents when crops are stored. I mean, there's a lot of products out there that are designed to help farmers, growers, producers protect the valuable crop that they have. Those products are extensively regulated. And I live here in California where we produce half of the nation's fruit, two thirds of the vegetables. We have the strictest standards of all the U.S. states. Things that get approved for a certain crop like strawberries get then taken off and then there's nothing new to replace it. And the growers are under more and more pressure We're also under pressure from consumers being pissed off about inflation and rising food prices. So the growers are caught in the middle between their customers at retail, food service, whatnot, wanting to offer a fair price to their end customer, right? So let's, okay, I I got ahead of myself there on the regulatory piece. When the Food and Drug Administration is looking at pesticide residues that are tolerable, and this is work that's done by toxicologists that calculate, okay, over a consistent, not a consistent, but 
the expected exposure of something in your diet over the course of your lifetime or during a critical period, pregnancy or childhood, what's the tolerable amount for pesticide residues in our food system, then it gets cut by either a hundred or a thousand fold. We now have equipment out there that can measure parts per trillion. And there are certain groups out there that will do this measurement and do fear mongering to create their lists of the produce items you should avoid, you know, and then they call the other lists, the clean ones. That messaging gets in the brain and gets in the way of eating foods that are so beneficial for so many reasons. Our food system is the safest in the world. We are very lucky to live in the United States. Our regulatory system is very rigorous. The people who look at the risks for these products are very thoughtful in how they apply science that is excruciatingly detailed. And so the risk of not eating fruits and vegetables is greater than the risk of eating them, enjoying them and embracing everything that's part of our food system that makes it safe and relatively affordable for most of us. Thank you for addressing that. You know, I personally feel like if I can get it organic and when it's in season, I will, right? Like when it's in season, I also think it tastes better, right? But I, but at the same time, I know for a fact that there are people who just won't eat berries if they can't get them organic and you can't always get them organic and to, oh, you know, or they can't get all, they can't buy a hundred percent of their produce organic, like their, their doctor tells them to do. And I'm like, that is such a disservice because it is better for you to get the nutrients from the food. If you're nourishing your body properly, a lot of the pesticides will be detoxed out naturally through our filtering process. But it's like th- missing out on the nutrients because of fear of what's sprayed on the food is to the detriment of health more than if they were just eating it and eating, you know, the, the things that have been sprayed on it and all of that. And I think there is a lot of not understand, like I'm still learning about the process that goes into it and what being willing to understand that there's risk in, a, in you know, approving something and then maybe retracting it down the road, like you said, right? Like, like there's, there's that, but people aren't tr- out, out there trying to poison you. They're trying to be productive, financially sustainable growers who are also protecting the environment, things living within that environment, their families that live on these family farms, the waterways that their communities rely on. You know, I'm glad you brought up organics and and how, you know, sometimes it's parity in terms of price, but often the organic products are a little bit higher. And for people who say, I feel guilty buying the conventional, the organic's too expensive, I'm not going to eat it at all find a way to find some calm and comfort in eating that produce, buy those berries, incorporate them as often as you can. And the organic industry has different standards for the kinds of pesticides that they can use. It's not that they don't use any, they're just different standards. But I think one of the more exciting aspects of berry production in particular, is there is this new technology to grow berries indoor on these walls so that the harvest process is easier. There's a big facility going up in Michigan by one of the big berry companies. So indoor production of berries. And then you've got an environment where there are fewer potential pests that can attack that crop. So the inputs are slightly less. Now, building an indoor berry farm is not inexpensive, but you also have fewer food miles for those berries to travel to like the East Coast. And that's what that Michigan facility is being built for. So there's so much innovation and research going on right now in the produce industry. It's just overwhelming. I was a few weeks ago in a screened in 11 acre grapefruit farm in Florida. And this was one of 30 of these. And, uh, you know, it's $100,000 per acre to build this facility. But when you're inside this fine mesh screen, the temperature is about 15 degrees warmer. The trees grow faster and they produce more fruit. And it's because of the photosynthesis from the screen. So this isn't super high tech, but it's finding investors who are willing to protect an industry, you know, and do this production so we can get this fruit 
of exceptional quality at reasonable prices. I mean, I, you know, I feel like I'm getting misty eyed because I have so much respect for the people who are doing this hard work on behalf of the rest of us. I love that you're sharing the new technology coming out because I feel like we hear about it so much further down the road, but it's been in place for a really long time. So we've been maybe avoiding food or, you know, demonizing certain things without that unnecessarily, because what we've learned is behind the time, right? My first thing that comes to mind is like, oh, are they going to be using UV lights on these berries? And like, you know, all those things that like we think about, like, are we going to, is it going to be nutritious or is it just going to be food, right? What's, what are the nutrition levels? Are they going to be comparable to something that's grown naturally in nature on the side of the road with all the, you know, the poop and the animals and all that versus in a, in a facility, how rich is the soil? Like I have all of these thoughts about it. And do you know anything about that process and yeah. the, the nutrition levels? Cause I feel like that's one of the things that they're like, they say or the nutrition levels vary so much depending on how it's grown that we kind of, we want the most bang for our buck, right? So if we're going to spend $5 on strawberries, we want to make sure we're getting the, the reason we're doing that is because we want the max nutrition along with, you know, supporting our body and not weighing it down more. So let's talk about that process. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. There are extensive breeding programs that look at how do berries thrive in a certain growing environment? How did they thrive when they're stressed for water? Here in California, we're often very stressed for water. Um, How do they thrive if they're grown in an indoor facility? The types of berries that will grow well in indoor are not the same varieties that grow in open fields. The varieties that do well for organic production are not the same varieties for conventional. You know, so a strawberry isn't a strawberry. A potato is not a potato. From the, 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 plant geneticists and plant breeders whom I've talked to, most of them say about 60 to 70% at most of a plant's genetic traits will determine its outcome. So its flavor, its appearance, its size, its nutrient profile, but the rest is determined by the environment. So a berry that has more heat stress, for example, right before harvest may have more of some of those beneficial compounds called phytonutrients. And that's because when plants are stressed, they create more of those compounds to protect their health or to protect them from an insect threat or something. Things that are like really bitter, like have you ever had Chinese bitter melon? That's bitter so that insects don't eat it, but it's also those bitter compounds are super powerful in our bodies for being protective. So, I mean, I, I could geek out on this for days, Marion. <laughs> I, I know. And that's why I want to have you come back because it's like understanding that like people get so concerned about the weather and how it's going to impact things, but Hey, this stress actually makes the food more nutritious for us. And are they replicating that in a industrial quote unquote environment, you know, where they're being grown inside? How are they able to and willing to, and do they stress the plant to make sure we're getting those phytonutrients and we're getting those beneficial qualities? Like, I feel like that to me, I I would, I want to know about that. I think that is important for if I'm going to buy their produce, I want to know I'm getting the most bang for my buck. So there's often trade-offs when you're looking at what's going to create the best, you know, we buy with our eyes, right? In retail, we're going to set aside the piece of produce that isn't perfect. So going back to the berry story, they're breeding for what's that berry going to look like? What's the size going to be? What's the flavor profile going to be? How long is it going to be the best quality as it moves from an indoor growing facility into a distribution center, into a retail store and into that shopper's home? There are companies out there looking at gene editing. Can you turn off or turn on genes that drive up the content of beneficial phytonutrients for us humans? Can you enhance the color to create a richer color, which tells more of a story about the potentially the phytonutrients, but sometimes tomato breeders, there's tomato breeders here at the university of California, Davis, my alma mater, who have looked at how do you get the absolute most lycopene in a tomato? Well, the tomato that expresses the most lycopene and also has the best flavor has white shoulders. It looks like it hasn't totally ripened or turned perfect red. So people won't buy that in retail. 
You don't want a tomato that has white shoulders. You want a tomato that's all red or all orange. Because it looks like it's ripe. Right. But that white shoulder is indicative of a genetic change within that plant that has beneficial nutrient properties, but not beneficial for retail sales. Mm. What do you do about that? You keep on with the breeding program to see if you can overcome the white shoulders and find the gene that will get the whole tomato to change color. I mean, the breeding, when I talk to breeders, again, I've got goosebumps because I just love this stuff. It's so fascinating to learn, but the trade-offs that are made are really maddening. So I think gene editing is really exciting for our food system, because if you can find that one gene that you need to turn on or turn off that has a benefit for us, whether it's related to food waste, to flavor, to nutrient content. I just, I, I'm excited about the future of how that's being done. There's one company that is looking at how to breed cherries that don't have um, pits. Can you imagine? Oh, oh my gosh. But that's like the best part. I love spitting. them out. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like watermelon season. We were kids, right? Yeah. You'd have yeah. watermelon seed spitting contests. But for pies and desserts and things, it would be nice to not have pits. But the thought that it wouldn't be able to like replicate itself and be dependent it, on scientists to do it. I, I, I'm i a little bit, I'm more of like a homesteader and like I want self-sufficiency and things like that. So the thought of being dependent, I'm like, oh, I'm not sure about that. But I also see the that people in general would be much happier eating something like that because it's less work. Right. Yeah. It also makes the desserts and the canning process and all of that so much easier. Yeah. And, and again, there you go. Trade-offs, right? On what's what's right for you, given your values and what you want versus what has a benefit for some other sector or individual. I think the the baby lettuces being grown in indoor facilities, like there's a massive one in New Jersey right outside of Manhattan. Those baby lettuces are bred for that indoor environment where there's no soil or sunlight, right? It's UV light. Water is misted on the root system and that water contains the nutrients that help those plants thrive. The baby kale is sweet. It doesn't have bitter compounds. So people like to eat it more but the bitter mm -hmm. compounds aren't there. So, you know, again, lots and lots of choice, lots and lots of different production systems, lots and lots of innovation and technology that is helping farmers be sustainable um, in a, you know, challenging, changing environment here in the U.S. Yeah, you know, and I think one of the things in the U.S. compared to people like who I talk to from other countries and things, people in other countries are used to produce that's imperfect. You know, they understand that there's going to be different colors. There might be some white that doesn't really impact the the ripeness of it. There, you know, and here in America, I feel like we're actually really, really far removed from food. And I think they've kind of trained us through marketing that it's all about color and looks and all of that. And I and like I don't I don't know how to fix that. Um, I think that's a much that's way too big of a fish to fry outside of education like this from the, the, from the roots up. Right. But people are like, I love heirloom tomatoes, but people don't like them because they're soft. They bruise. Why is it purple? Why is it green? Why does it have white stripes on it? You know? And I'm like, have you tasted one? They're amazing. Yes. They, they are soft. <laughs> right. Like yeah. they, they've been, gene edited to have thicker skin so that they're not bruised by the time they get to the store and into your home and things like that. My dad talks about that all the time, how when he was a kid, tomatoes were super soft and now they're really hard and kind of flavorless and grainy. And he loves, you know, we love the heirloom tomatoes and things like that. Cause that's what he, he remembers produce tasting like, right. Tomatoes are definitely a lightning rod. You know, when I worked for the Culinary Institute of America and we talk about produce at conferences, chefs went wild talking about tomatoes and everybody has that childhood perfect tomato memory. A lot of the tomatoes that show up in retail or that go into food service are harvested hard and green and then they're treated with ethylene the same way that bananas and mangoes are to get them to ripen. So that harvesting green allows them to be transported without bruising or whatnot. Then they get treated with ethylene, which is a natural substance that causes fruits to ripen, you know, but the, the quality is not the same. But, you know, if you're going to put a tomato slice on millions of burgers every day, 
a 16 year old in a fast food restaurant and you have like an heirloom tomato cutting. No, you, no, you're not. No, nope. <laughs> you're going to nope, have a, it's a, get blob, a, a blob, a blob of tomato seed. mush. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, so again, there's a reason for all of this. I think for those of us who are fortunate enough to have more control over our choices and have a little more income and have that appreciation for seasonal opportunities like heirloom tomatoes, that is glorious. But I, we also have to have respect for people who they don't care about this as much, but if we can get something on a menu or on a plate and they will eat it and it'll become part of their eating pattern, even if they're not aware of it, we need to celebrate that too. I'm a big fan of celebrating small wins and Amen. any way that we can incorporate more of it and get people eating more of it is the way to go. And then the natural progression is eventually you start learning and finding ways, right? Right. And sometimes you don't, which is fine. You know, everybody has their choices and priorities in life. But typically in my world, people are very health driven. They're they're sick. They want to get healthy. And so, you know, what I always tell them is that we, there's always a starting point and you have to give yourself time to be a beginner and then you can go deeper and deeper and deeper. Right. But there's even a point where like it was even too much for me and I had to like step it back and make choices and pros and cons of, you know, how am I going to eat it versus it, will it actually get eaten? Yeah. You know? And what can I do to make sure my kids are getting exposed to things, but I'm not spending an hour in the kitchen when I need to be also doing homework and sitting down and playing and going outside and, you know, all of those things, like there's just, there's so much. And I feel like people just feel so oppressed. So hopefully this episode, people feel like they can maybe breathe a little bit and understand, um, you know, I would love to actually dive into more of the chemicals that are used, like the, with the ripening agent, you know, people talk about that and it's so demonized. Okay. Well, if it's a natural substance, like how does that work? Yeah. If you've ever heard the tip, you know, you've got some green bananas or partly green bananas from the store and you put an apple in a bag with them. Apples are notorious for putting off lots of ethylene, this natural substance that fruits produce to prompt ripening. And so ethylene in a bag with bananas is the same thing as hundreds of pounds of bananas in an ethylene ripening room next to a distribution center to go off to your local supermarket. It's just, you know, a yeah, system. And that nature created that we're taking advantage of. And, and, you know, we hear these chemical terms and we instantly are taught that it's bad. Right. And what I found is there are some that are not great and there, there needs to be better options. We don't have any right now, but there needs to be, but then there's some that we hear of and we're scared of, then you learn and you're like, well, that's silly. Why would somebody fear monger that? Right. And so yep. I would love to have you back and for us to kind of dive into more. Cause like I said, there's, there's just so much to learn and you could, you have your wealth of information and there's just so much to do. And I love your passion for it. Like, I feel like getting to hear it from somebody who is health focused and really cares and understands the different dynamics. is just so beneficial. Um, we have, we are running out of time. So, and I could just talk to you forever also. So (laughs) is there anything that anything you want to leave people with, and then how can they find your cookbooks and maybe even, you know, if they are a farm and want some consulting, how do they reach out to you? Yeah. So my business name is farmers. So farmer apostrophe S farmers daughter consulting. My name is Amy Myrdal Miller. I'm on social media as all a heart Amy, because my cookbook is cooking all a heart and you can find it wherever books are sold. So check with your local bookstore, ask them to order it for you. Or if you order from the big companies, they all have access to it. And I think, you know, a final note, Marion, um, for everybody out there listening, who's striving, you know, for better health, but also like less anxiety about our food system, find those small things you can do today that are positive for you. If that means I'm going to have an apple as a snack this afternoon And I'm going to cherish in that crunchy, sweet deliciousness of that variety of apple that I've never tried before. Celebrate that. If you're making dinner tonight for someone you love and you open up a bag of frozen broccoli, celebrate that. You're putting broccoli in front of them. You know, just take those little, little steps that you can be proud of that can help you feel better and that are going to have a positive impact on your health and well-being. Awesome. Thank you so much. 
for talking with me, uh, for sharing your knowledge and your passion with us. It's been a very exciting conversation for me. And I look forward to talking to you again in a couple of months. I would welcome the opportunity to join you again, Mary. And thanks for this opportunity today. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. If you found this episode helpful, would you do me a favor and help others find it by leaving a review, sharing a screenshot on social media, or sharing the link with a friend? By you sharing what you've learned, others are able to find this podcast and join our community. Be sure to check out my website, www.roadtolivingwhole.com for over 160 delicious recipes, a variety of meal plans, and a blog packed full of even more healthy living tips. If you'd like to learn more about how to work with me as your coach, you can schedule a free consult through www.roadtolivingwhole.com backslash health-coaching backslash. Until next time, friend. Bye.